morning. Uh, let's start with the word this morning. And I like one of the verses so much last week that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump back a little bit, read there, and then we're going to be in chapter 12 for a little bit today. So verse 36 in chapter 11 says this, For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Then we'll skip over last week and we'll come to verse number 3 in chapter 12. It says, Because of the privilege and the authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, for, to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving, serve others. Serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Everybody put a smile on your face. No, like... Like, make it happen. Some of you, that's harder than others. I know. It's just, we're happy. We're in church, right? Okay. Well, you should be happy today. You get to see my face. It's looking all right, right? All right. Good. Good. Well, we are in a series called Good News, Bad News. Going through the book of Romans. I don't know. We're in chapter 12, so we're almost there. Like, we're on our way. We're on our way. Actually, five weeks. <laughs> five weeks left of Romans, in case that number didn't mean something else to you. It means that there's only about five weeks left of this series that we're in. If you are here last week, you'll remember that we learned that you exist to glorify God. And then we see as Paul sets us up with that, he then goes on to say, so you need to live your life as a living and holy sacrifice. That, you, that your life is a way to worship God. And you do this because of all God has done for you. Because of all he's done for you, you live this way. So you, you don't copy the behaviors of the world. You don't live for the things that the world lives for. Instead, you let God transform your mind to renew your mind. And when he changes the way you think, he'll change the way you behave, and it impacts the way that you live. Kind of remember something like that, a little bit of that last week? Well, then he goes straight from there into talking about the church. Maybe you didn't catch that, but he said the body of Christ, which means the church. So he goes to talk about the church and how we have gifts, and God has given us each different gifts to use as one. And I think it's cool. He talks about the church and compares it to the body. And he says, the body has many different parts that have different function, but they're all still one body. I love that analogy. I think the body's pretty cool. I think I'm, you like that, Daniel. Well, I've been practicing all week for this. I am not a baseball player. However, it's baseball season, so I thought it only be right if I brought a baseball to illustrate a point to you. I think the body's pretty cool. This, this hand, by itself, can grip a ball. This is how you throw a fastball, right? <laughs> if you know baseball, you're like, that guy doesn't have a clue what he's talking about, okay? <laughs> I know this is not how you throw a fastball. It's a curve. I get it. I understand. Change up. Oh, change. That's what I meant. Yeah, cha that's what I meant. Change up. I, I, I know what I'm talking about. But it's pretty cool that the hand has the ability to grasp the ball. I can grab it. I can let it go. Grab it. Let it I mean, that's pretty unique. I think the body's a pretty interesting thing. And just by itself, the hand can do just that. Pretty cool. Now, if you add the wrist to the hand, guess what? It can throw the ball. You want to see it? <laughs> pretty good, huh? Can I get that ball? I was not supposed to throw it. I forgot. I got so much more to do with this ball. Can I have that? Thank you so much. But that's pretty cool, right? I mean, with, with just adding the wrist to the hand, it can go from just doing this, just holding the ball, to actually throw, oh, throwing the ball. It's more exciting practicing in front of people than by yourself. This is pretty cool. Now, if you want to get real creative, add the forearm and the elbow, and guess what? I'm a pitcher, right? Do you see this? This is, this is true pitching motion. How many of you think I'm going to throw the ball and hurt somebody today? You're all awake still, at least for the beginning of the message, aren't you? All right. Right? You get, the el you get the elbow and the forearm, and now we got, we got a bad thrower, okay? <laughs> Maybe we add the upper arm and the shoulder, and this is how pitchers go, right? <laughs> if you're a fan of the Detroit Tigers, this is kind of what... <laughs> I don't watch baseball, but I don't think they're doing so hot this year. I watch the Cubs every once in a while, so they're all right right now. <laughs> but it's pretty cool. By itself, it can hold the ball. 
Grip it, drop it, grip it, drop it. Add a few more parts and you got something going on. You had the rest of the body, you had, you had your muscles that come here, you had your core, and now, uh, now we're doing it, right? This is how you throw a baseball, right? Did I tell you I played sports growing up? I was very athletic. <laughs> but let's just say, let's just say we want to get the whole body involved. Now, now we're talking. You go from the stretch position, I'm doing my best, right? <laughs> You get that knee raise, you use your whole body and everything working together. Now I can throw at least a 30 mile an hour pitch, <laughs> all right? But by, by itself, it can only do so much. But working together with the whole body as one, your mind's working, your body's working, your arms, your legs, your, your lungs, your heart, everything works together and makes you be able to accomplish. If your mission is to throw a 30 mile an hour fastball, you can accomplish that by working together. Does that make sense? That's kind of cool kind of cool how the body can do that. Well, Paul says your body is similar to the church, Christ's body. And we see this in lots of places in the church. It compares the church, a body of believers, a body of people gathered together. It says you're just like a body. You all have different functions, different gifts, different parts, but you're all one in the same together. And so he goes on to say you got many different gifts God has given you, but if you use them together, you can accomplish something far greater than yourself. And just as the hand by itself can only do that, that's not a great pitch, but working together with the body can do so much more. It can accomplish so much more. I believe that the church is the same way. You by yourself are awesome. You are a masterpiece created by God on purpose for a purpose. But you can do so much more if you join the body of Christ and we work together. We can accomplish a greater task together than on our own. So I was thinking about this. I started thinking... You, you become a Christian when you begin a relationship with Jesus, right? It starts with a relationship with Christ, believing that he came for you, that he died for you, and that he rose again for you. That's faith. When you believe that that's true, that Jesus came and died and rose again for you, you become a Christian. But then Jesus does something cool. He doesn't just say, okay, let's go to heaven right now. He says, I'm going to leave you on earth. I got a plan and a purpose for you. I got some things I want you to do. So stay there for a little bit. But he says, hey, it's time to meet the family. And you know this. When you start to get serious about your girlfriend, you have to let them meet the family. That's mom and crazy uncle Bob, right? We all got one. Maybe it's not named Bob. Sorry if you're named Bob in the room. You're probably not the crazy uncle. Right? When you're getting serious about someone, you begin a relationship with someone, say, hey, come meet the family. Come join the family. So Jesus does that. We get saved. We begin a relationship with Jesus. He says, hey, I want you to come meet the family. It's called the church. You belong here. There's a place for you here, and I want you to use the gift that I've given you, and I want you to join and be a part of the local body called the church. Now, I want you to hear this very quickly. If you have notes and you want to write something down, if you're one of those people, um, I want you to write this down. This is very important that you catch this. Being a part of the church is not the same as going to church. You didn't like it. <laughs> Hang on. I'll, I'll say it from over here. Maybe it's the ball. Being. A part of the church is not the same as going to church. Yeah. Oh, you guys understood it a little bit. All right. So you don't have to do that. It's just I'm the kind of guy that likes to make sure that you're listening. And I work so hard on that sentence, like 10 minutes at least, <laughs> on that one sentence. It's bolded and everything. Now, last week we talked about how the world lives. The world, people that don't believe in Jesus, for, for the most part, and we even sneak this into our life too, we live for pleasing ourselves. For what makes us happy, what pleases us, what gives us glory. We're, we're on the lookout for us. The world revolves around us. Now, there's some great people out there that don't believe in Jesus. Don't, don't hear me wrong. But the point is, for the most part, we're just like, if we're here, we might as well make sure that we're happy. And so we learned about that last week. The world lives for its own pleasure, its own happiness, its own glory. And that can sneak into the church world sometimes, where people come to church and they think that the church is all about them. How can the church serve me? So we sit here and we go, well... I mean, those girls saying okay, but I mean, a little, little pitchy at times. No offense, that was a joke. I'm not talking about anyone here. <laughs> There's another church I visited a couple weeks ago, right? I mean, they were all right, but I mean, well, the song just didn't touch me today, you know? No big deal. It's not my favorite one. Drummer, he was a little faster than he should have been in that one transition. I don't know if you caught it, but I did. It was a little off. I mean, the preacher, I mean, let's be honest. The ball was cool, but he dropped it like three times. <laughs> And the message, I mean, I don't know. This wasn't for me. I don't really like the translation they use. It was okay, though. Oh, whatever. You know, the snacks were good, but they don't realize I've been on this keto diet, and there was, there was carbs all over that thing. 
there was only one piece of cheese I could eat. But I guess for other people too. Oh. It was all right. Not bad. I like that church. I just don't know. It doesn't really feed me that well. It doesn't really serve me that well. Now, again, if you're looking for a church, I hope you come and you're like, man, how can, how can this church be something I can be a part of? I think that's the question we need to ask. This isn't, this isn't to knock people that you're looking for churches. I mean, there's a lot of churches out there, and you want to make sure that you can join it and be a part of it, and it's a good church. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things you want to look for, but so often in the world, in churches, it's about a consumer mindset. What can I get out of going to church? Instead, what if we flip that sentence? Instead of how can I be served, we started saying how can I serve? Because there's a difference between going to church and being the church. There's a difference between just going to church and being the church. I'm not sure how long I'm going to keep this baseball in my hand or if I'm going to throw it at some point, but I think I'm going to try to preach the entire time with it if you're okay with that. So if you start falling asleep, <laughs> we're going to see how those two years back in third grade <laughs> helped. That's all I played. Not, no, I didn't spend two years. Of, wait, wait. Pause. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Clarify for a moment. <laughs> I meant back in the third grade, I played baseball for approximately two years. It was sixth grade that I spent two years. Oh, my goodness. Somewhere in here, there's a message to be preached. I just got to find it. Just gotta find it. So I was thinking about how can I serve, and I, I was reading this text that we're in. We're talking about the body and different members of the body, and they have one purpose and they belong to each other. And God's given us different gifts, and He kind of says basically, whatever gift you have, I don't really really care what gift you've been given. Just do it really well. Like do it for the glory of God. Do it well. Serve, serve others well. If it's g giving, give generously. Whatever you do, just like do it with excellence. And I started to realize that we came to this moment in time in our message series, in our series calendar, at just the right time. Because what's happening? In five weeks, we're going to two services. And I started to think that God really brought us to this at just the right time. Maybe you think it's silly. Maybe it's a coincidence. Maybe you think we planned it this way. I don't know. But at some point, I was going to say, we're about five weeks out. We need to start talking to, about serving in the church. And here we come to this passage where Paul says that you're part of one body. And the body works together to accomplish the mission. And I was like, boom. That's what it's all about. We're here to use our gifts to help work together as one body. So what I want to do for the rest of our time together, I felt like this was perfect timing to help just maybe encourage you a little bit, to help you see that maybe there's a few reasons for you to serve in the church. So I want to give you five reasons to serve. Five reasons to serve. Trent is top 10, right, all the time. You guys know that about Pastor Trent? He loves his top 10 stuff. I am half as smart as Trent. So we got top five. And it just so happens to work out that it's August 5th. And we have five weeks till this. I just put it all together right now. Boom! Man! I did it all on purpose. Oh, that is good. Five things. I want to give you five reasons to serve. So if you got notes, you got a blank piece of paper, we're just going to spend the rest of our time talking about five reasons for you to serve in the church. There's ways to serve outside the church, but here's five reasons for you to serve in the church. You ready? Are you ready? Yeah. You're ready. Now, for those of you in the church that you're just checking us out, I want you to just take a deep breath. Come on. And let it out. It's, it's not for you. Be our guest. Be our guest. Be our guest. We sang that a couple weeks ago. Be our guest. Relax. Okay, we're here. I want you to, to decide if this is a place that you feel like you can jump in and be a part of. If you're new today or you've been checking us out for just a few weeks, this is to just encourage you to see that there might be a place someday for you in the future to join in. So this, this message isn't for you if you just came today. Like, Man, I, if I'm going to go to that church, they're going to make me serve next week. No. It's all good. But there are some people in the room today that have been coming for a while that say River's Edge is my home church. River's Edge is the place I want to be connected to. It's a part of the local body that I say, yeah, I want to be the elbow. Woo! Elbow gets cool stuff. And you want to be a part of the church? Now might be the time for you to say, you know what? I've been coming for a while. I've been checking it out. This is my place. It might be a time for you to step up. And step in and start serving with us. Because I can promise you this, it is more fun serving and volunteering than just coming. It is more fun being a part of the church than just being in the church. It's true in almost area, almost area, almost every area of our life. Almost every area of our life. It's more fun to do the dishes for your wife at home than to let her do the dishes for you. Everybody knows that. <laughs> 
I should stick to what I got going on here. Now, for those of you that are already serving, that you say, man, I'm serving and I'm tired. <laughs> it's okay. I get tired serving too. I want to encourage you today with five reasons to serve. Maybe to renew your mind and renew your heart on why you do what you do. Why do you serve at the church? There are plenty of people here that are serving or volunteering. I just want to say thank you because we cannot do what we do at River's Edge without volunteers. It's not possible without your help. So thank you so much for serving. But hopefully maybe for you guys, it's not an encouragement to go sign up to serve. Maybe today it's an encouragement to just help you realize that there are some reasons that you serve and you want to just make sure that your heart and right, mind are in the right spot as we are in five weeks going to serve. So here we go. Number one, I am gifted to serve. I am gifted to serve. We see it in our passage today in Romans chapter 12 that God has given us different gifts, but in also in 1 Peter, it says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. So use them to serve one another. Use them well to serve one another. You know the purpose of your gift? This guy's got a shirt on that says 1 Peter 4.10. That's why I got distracted and he made me look at him and he's showing me a shirt. It just says 1 Peter. But use your gift to serve others. The purpose of your gift is not for your own glory. The purpose of your gift, the purpose of God giving you gifts, talents, and abilities is so that you can serve other people well. You've been gifted by God, not so you can brag about your stuff, but gifted by God so that you can serve other people well. And it's kind of cool. I love this, that, that our purpose of our gift is not for our own glory. And in Romans chapter 12, if you remember, he said, be humble. He kind of started the first thing. Don't look at yourself and think you're better than you really are. He starts off by saying, be humble. Check yourself before you wreck yourself because there's no room for pride in the body of Christ. If you're going to serve in the church, there's no room for you to think that your gift is better than anyone else's gift. But on the flip side, don't, don't think too much of yourself and don't look at other people's gifts and say, I wish I had that. It's called gift envy. You don't need that. Oh, I just wish I could stand on the stage and throw a baseball. That'd be so much more fun than sitting here and listening. Well, it's not, it's not what you're gifted for maybe right now. And I'm not gifted either, but they let me do it. That's awesome. I like it. Do what you can do and do it well. We're all kind of different, right? Yeah, that's true. Turn to your partner and say, you're different. Did I say neighbor or partner? Or, I don't know. Turn your partner. Don't snow. Partner? I, I was in South Dakota for about five years. That was my southern accent, even though South Dakota's in the north. Um, that's why I started talking about partners. So anyway. Um, yeah, turn to your neighbor and say, uh, you're different. Go ahead. You forgot it this time. And say, that's okay. It's okay. My mom's been telling me I'm different for 31 years, and it's okay. I just, I'm different. We have different gifts and different abilities. Some people in this room can sing. Woo! They can sing. Some of you. <laughs> um, some of you do some good, just not always with your mouth and melody. And that's okay. God loves to hear you sing whether you're on the stage or not. God loves to hear you sing even if you're not that great of a singer. Some of you can sing. Some of you are incredible with children. I mean, kids love hanging around you. You're the, you're the life of the party all the time. Some of you, you walk in the room, kids just start crying. <laughs> right? Guess what? I don't know if the nursery is the place for you to serve. That's okay. Okay, some of you have a bubbly, smiley face all the time. I mean, it, it's like you're constantly filled with the joy of the Lord, and it just flows out for wherever you go, and people look at you, and they think, that person drinks way too much caffeine, and you're just so happy and smiley and awesome. Guess what? You would be an incredible greeter. Some of you wish that you never had to shake another person's hand again in your life. That's okay, because we're all different. God created us differently. Some are like a hand. Some are like an elbow. That's okay. Some are the armpit. It's just the way it works. It's all, it's necessary. I don't know why, but it's there, part of the body. God gives each of us different gifts. You're gifted to serve. It's part of how God created you. He created you so that you would use your gift well to serve one another. Not only that, number two, my church family needs my service. I, I got to encourage you with this, that your church family needs your service. First Corinthians 12, I love this translation specifically, how it words this first. Now, here is what I'm trying to say. All of you together are one body of Christ. We heard that in Romans chapter 12. And each one of you is a separate, and I like this add-on, a necessary part. Did you catch that? Separate and necessary. It says you're all part of the body, 
You, you have separate gifts, separate parts, but each one is also necessary. Your gift and you are necessary in the body of Christ. When, when you get saved, you become a part of the body of Christ. And the body needs you to come and use your gift. We need you. You have been gifted and you are needed. And you may look and say, I don't see a perfect fit for my gift in the body of Christ. That's okay. Find a place to serve anyway. Did you know that there's no spiritual gift of parking lot greeters? Did you know that there's no spiritual gift of making coffee? It's not in the Bible. You're not going to see it where it says, uh, the spiritual gift of making coffee is my gift. But we still need people to help park cars, and we still need people to make coffee. I don't have the spiritual gift of coffee making. My wife can word for word tell me how to make coffee exactly how she does, and it turns out worse every single time. I'm serious. It's also because I used to think that a tablespoon and a teaspoon were the same thing. <laughs> so when it said put two tablespoons of co coffee thing in, I was like, oh, two teaspoons. And I was like, this is the grossest thing I've ever, it's like crap water. I mean, it's terrible. <laughs> Crappy water. Anyway, let's get back to what I'm talking about. There's no spiritual gift of coffee making, but we need people to help make coffee. We need people to help park cars. We need you in the church to help serve. We're going to go to two services in how many weeks? Five weeks. Five weeks. Now, next week, it's going to change, okay? So don't be like, five? Oh, man, I messed it up. In five weeks, we're going to two services. And right now, to make one service happen, we need about 30-ish volunteers on a Sunday. Did you know that? 30-ish people right now are serving to make this, not paid, but serving voluntarily to make church happen here at River's Edge. Now, when we go to two services, you would think it would double to 60, but it doesn't. We've made some changes, made some adjustments, so that when we go to two services, every weekend, we're going to need 45-ish people, volunteers, to serve to make church happen. That's, that's more people. And with more opportunities, we're going to two services for what? For the more opportunities to help more people hear more about Jesus, it's going to take more volunteers. We need more people. Your church family needs you. Number three, I'm not only gifted to serve, but I'm called to serve. In John chapter 12, it says, anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am. This is Jesus speaking. And the Father will honor anyone who serves me. It said, if you want to serve me, you got to follow after me. Now, now, follow this. So if we serve Jesus, there's honor in that. If we serve Jesus, we need to follow him and do what he does. So what did Jesus do? Matthew chapter 20, it says, For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. Another translation, I think I threw it up on the screen, uh, says it this way. I like how it phrases this first part. Your attitude must be like my own, says Jesus. For I, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. Your attitude needs to be the same as Christ. The Son of Man did not come to be served. He didn't come so that we could, we could serve him. The Son of Man came to serve others. Did you know Jesus left heaven where he was being worshipped? Left heaven where he was being worshipped to come, and he picked up a towel... And he began to wash people's feet. And a Christian is someone who follows after Jesus. Takes on the same attitude of Christ. He served us to the point of death on a cross. He was beaten, <clears throat> mocked, spit upon, bruised, whipped, and died so that you and I could have life. He sacrificed himself for us. That's what Jesus did. That's the attitude that we need to have. To say, we, we're not here to be served. We don't go to church so they can serve me. What can I get out of it? We, we go to church, find a way to plug in and be a part of the body of Christ. How can I serve? How can I serve? Serving is not about you. It's about glorifying God. And number four, number four. Serving is my response to Jesus. Serving is my response to Jesus. If we go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Why? Because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Because of what Jesus has done for you, we need to live our life in such a way that our response is serving him. Our response is to live our lives as a, as a living and holy sacrifice. It's our response where everything comes from God. Every breath you take and every step you make, every word you say, every gift or ability or talent that you have, everything comes from God. 
And the breath he gave you is meant to be given back to him in worship. And the same is true about the gifts that you have. The gifts and talents and abilities, your ability to serve and to move and to do things, that is to be given back as a way to worship. Everything we do is to be given back as, as like a thank you note, as a response to what God has done. Now, it's not just about serving in the church. Today I'm using it because we happen to be, how many weeks out? I didn't know if you remember. We happen to be five weeks out from two services, and the truth is we need more volunteers. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I don't feel bad saying that. There's plenty of places for you to give back to the church and help more people learn, hear more about Jesus. So I'm okay with saying that out loud. But it's not just in the church that you need to be serving. I think in every area of our life, if you start serving, it makes things better. Think about your marriage. Maybe right now you're going through a, a difficult marriage time. Or maybe your marriage is just kind of like, mm, you know, or your marriage is going awesome and you just want to keep making it go awesome. Guess what? Start serving your spouse and see what happens. Start serving your spouse and see how they respond. Start doing things for them that they normally do. Start doing things for them that, that, that ease their plate or just be kind and serve them in such a way and see what happens. You say, well, I don't know how to serve my wife. I don't know what to do. Guess what? Just ask her. She's probably got a list already made up for you. I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean like she probably got some things in her mind that you could find a way to help serve her. And I promise you it will impact in a positive way your relationship and your marriage if you start serving your wife. Maybe it's at work. You say, you know what? I like where I'm at, but I'd love to move a little higher up the ladder. I'd love to work a little better. I love a different career. I love higher. Start serving. Go into work tomorrow and say, how can I serve today? Go up to your boss and tell her. Tell her this. Hey, um, how can I serve you today? She will spit her coffee all over the place when you do that. Or he, whatever your boss. Because normally they have people coming to them saying, you know, it's not, this is not really convenient for me. Can you give me some time off? Can you help me make this place a little bit better work? Can, I got an idea for you. Can, can you make my idea? But normally they have people coming to them all the time asking for things for them. How can they be served at this place? I doubt they have people coming to them all the time and say, hey, just today, like, I just really want to serve you well. How can I best serve you? Watch how it changes your work environment. If, if you have some relationships issues, maybe with your parents, maybe you're a teenager, whether in the house or out of the house, or maybe you're an adult and there's still some issues going on with your parents, try serving your parents and see your mom freak out. And watch her take you to the doctor's office because she's like, um, I'm sorry, you want to do what for who? Me? You don't want money. You want to do something for me. Watch how it starts to change your relationship. In your marriage, start serving your spouse. In, in your work, start serving. In your relationship, start serving. In every area of life, just start serving and see how it, it positively impacts what is going on in your life. And you don't do it because of your boss. You don't do it because of your spouse. You don't do it because of your pastor at church. You do it because of Jesus. You serve out a response for all he's done for you. What if we had this attitude when we prayed? Dear God, how can I serve you today? God, what can I do for you today? I promise God gets plenty of people coming to him saying, God, what can you do for me? And listen, I, I know that the word is full of scripture that tells us that we need to go to God with our cares. Cast all your cares on him for he cares for you. I believe God wants our, our needs and our wants. He wants us to, to bring everything to him. But if that's all we do when we go to God and say, God, what can you do for me? How can you serve me? We're missing something. What if tomorrow we woke up and we said, God, today I, I just want to serve you well. What can I do for you? I believe with all my heart that God will begin to open up opportunities, begin to point you in the right direction to help you do just that, to do service for God, to serve God in a, in a powerful way. Number five. Serving makes my life meaningful. 1 Corinthians 15 says this. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Ooh, I like that. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. This verse says, when you serve God, in any way, when you serve God by serving others, it is never meaningless it is never useless. God sees you, even if no one else does. God sees you. God's looking up from heaven and goes, I see that. I see what you're doing. 
When you sit in the nursery and hold a baby that's crying, guess what? God sees you. It's not meaningless. You're not just babysitting. There's purpose for that. We have a nursery because we want to, to the best of our ability, provide a distraction-free environment for people to hear the gospel. When you do that, when you watch that little baby, you're providing a distraction-free environment for everyone in this room. Not only that, but you're helping that mother who maybe this is the one hour of week that she gets freedom from that little beautiful, wonderful gift from God. <laughs> but you're giving her a moment, a moment to be refreshed and recharged, a moment to be her, herself, a moment to connect with other people, a moment to worship, a moment to be challenged. Man, when you hold that little baby, not only are you providing a distraction-free environment and you're helping that mom get a little bit of a break, but beyond that, you are loving on that gift from God. You're going to hold that baby. You're going to love that baby. You're going to change that stinky diaper and you're going to do it with a smile on your face because you're not doing it for the baby or for the mom or for the church or for the pastor. You're doing it for the Lord. And whatever you do for the Lord is never meaningless. You're not just holding the door, standing out there going, why do I have to hold the door for people? They can hold their own door. It's just a door. Door. I don't know why I like the word door. And you're out there going, what's the purpose? This is pointless. No, no, no. There's purpose in you holding the door. Because we want people to walk in and see a smiling face. Open the door from them that says, we care about you so much. We're going to open the door. You can do it yourself, but we're going to do it for you. Why? Because we care about you. Because Jesus loved us so much that he gave his life for us, and so we love you so much that we're going to give a little bit of our time to hold a door open. People know how to park their car. They do it at Walmart all the time. Some people don't do it very well. My car got scratched the other day. I didn't park very well. And I was in the car, and I was too chicken to say anything. <laughs> I'm strong and immovable, the Lord just said. But I was too scared to get out of my car. She was at least 16, I'm just saying. And I was like, sorry. People can park their cars, but why do we do that? Because we want the moment that people get on our property to feel like they matter, to feel like we were expecting them here, to feel like we care, to break down any barrier, anything that's keeping them from hearing about Jesus. We want to make them as comfortable as possible so when they sit here, when the gospel is proclaimed and Jesus is proclaimed that he came and he died and he rose again for them and that he wants a relationship for them, we want them to not have anything keep them not going, well, I didn't have a place to park today. I want them to be focused and hear what Jesus has done for them on the cross. And give them ability and chance to respond. What you do for the Lord is never meaningless. There's purpose. It's never useless. So you can go to church or you can be the church. You can ask, how can the church serve me today? Or you can serve. Say, how can I serve? It's about being part of something bigger than you. Guess what? If we had to, I could do church all by myself. I could be the hand, and maybe I get a wrist so someone can play behind me, because I really like that. So, so we have the hand and the wrist, and you can throw the ball. If the, if the mission of the ball, of the ball, the mission of me was to throw the ball today, I could do it with just a wrist and a hand. I could probably do church just by myself. And that's not a bragging there, just saying like to preach, and I mean, we'd, maybe we wouldn't have great music, maybe you don't get coffee. But we can do so much more. If we realize that we are all a part of this, it's not just one person on the stage speaking sometimes. We're all a part of this, and we need to work together to be one, united. Different parts with different gifts, united as one. We can do so much more. We can be a part of something greater. So today, we're going to give you not five opportunities, but two opportunities to maybe serve. Maybe you're in the room, and, and you don't have, you're like, yeah, that was for me. I needed that message. I need to start serving. I've been coming long enough. It's time for me to step up. I'm ready. We're going to give you an opportunity because when we go to two services in five weeks, uh, we have two areas that are going to be greatly affected. Our kids' ministry, zero to fifth grade, and our Sunday morning ministry, which is like greeters, ushers, parking lot, snack and yak, and coffee. Those are the two areas that are going to be greatly affected. So as you walk out today, as you're outside walking down the sidewalk, you're going to see two tables out there. There's going to be smiling volunteers standing out there, so happy that you're walking past them. And instead of walking past them, we're going to ask that you just take a moment to stop. And say, could I serve there? How can I serve? For some of you that are already serving, maybe today you say, you know, I'm serving somewhere else, but I could, I could maybe do a little more. Like maybe I could serve in the nursery every once in a while, even though I serve on the women's ministry team. Maybe I could serve in the nursery every once in a while, even though I'm on the worship team. Maybe I can hold a door open every once in a while, even though I run sound. 
So maybe there's an opportunity for you to step up and serve a little bit more. Maybe it's for the first time. Maybe you walk past because you're already serving a lot or it's your first time here and you're scared to come back. Don't be scared. We're so glad to have you. We want you here. You belong here. You need it here. So remember, you were created by God. You exist by his power and you were intended for his glory. And I believe that serving is one way that we can glorify God. With our whole life, you were created and gifted to serve. You're called to serve. It's your response to Jesus. You don't do it because the pastor said to do it. You do it because of you have a heart to serve and live your life as an act of holy, living worship to God. And when you do serve God, it is never meaningless. It's never meaningless. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this day. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for creating us. Thank you for your son and the gift that he was to us. The sacrifice, the, the, the way that he came to give his life as an act of service for us. And because of what Jesus has done for us, may we live our life serving other people, serving you. And we always remember it's never meaningless. It's never useless.